So in our last episode, I discussed how multimillionaires use this widely used but rarely discussed financial vehicle and financial tool called life insurance to help them build not only their wealth but also their businesses. And I promise you in this episode that I'm going to share with you how. I've got case studies, I've got some data points, i got uh, some figures to show you how the government just loves these type of strategies. So stay tuned, grab your notes, because I'm bringing it to you here in this episode of the 7 Figure Squad happening right now. What's cracking, everybody? My new smart guy, Master Paul here, hailing to you from the Seven Figure Squad studio here in Oak Brook Terrace, Illinois. Uh, before I begin, guys, if you haven't done so already, if you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like, follow our business page, so therefore we can start helping you think like a millionaire, help you strategize like a millionaire, so therefore you can become a first-generation cash flow millionaire. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe, hit the notification, be alerted the next time we upload our next episode. Okay, so listen, I've had the rare, the very rare experience of being in business and being inside the insurance industry, being in one, one industry for 21 years. I started my career in the insurance industry at 24 years old, and today I'm 46 years old, about to turn 47. I had the rare, rare, rare experience and timeline of being over two decades in this industry. And a lot of, lots of times people say, man, I got these ideas, got these thoughts, and then, you know, put your money here, put your money there, I got these ideas on this, I got the ideas on that. And here's what I discovered. Here's what I discovered. I just stayed with one thing for 21 years. A lot of people tried to distract me and to do other things with my money, how to do other things with my career, focus my attention in other areas. But I found one thing, 21 years in one thing. And this is the industry I've made my millions in. And oftentimes I've seen, you know, banks, when, I, when, the, when the hard times hit, crumble. When, I, when I've seen uh, 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 real estate, uh, everything's great during great times, but down times, I've seen things like 401k plans and IRAs, great ones, great times, but tough times. Here, here's what I discovered. Come over here real quick. So here, here's, what, here's what I discovered. If you want to build your financial house, I'm, giving you an, uh, I'm gonna give you a, a, an illustration here in a second, but if you wanna build your financial house, the first thing you gotta build it on is solid ground. In this case, a brick. Not on paper, people on paper were millionaires. People on paper, a uh, net worth, uh, they had to wait for the economy. The economy changed, boom, the, the wealth was gone. But no, if you want to build your wealth, your financial home, you got to build it on solid ground based on principles, on values, values and principles. What do you stand for? Oftentimes I see so many people chasing the dollar too fast, too soon, get rich quick. Next thing you know, they burn out. If they're on drugs, they're on alcohol, they're on addictions because they had to deal with the stresses of the job. But if you want to build your financial house, boom, values and principles. What do you stand for? And oftentimes I see, you know what? Sometimes, uh, sometimes a lot of good things happen with time. Not in six months, not in 12 months, not in two years, not in five years. Certain things just happen with time. I've had my ups and downs, ups and downs, but I'm so glad, at least from a financial perspective, that once I decide to build my financial home on this financial tool called life insurance, no matter what happened, no matter what happened, my financial house stood solid. And people are wondering, how much do I believe in it? Well, this is the reason why I have a ton of life insurance. I showed in the last video. Well, Matt, is it one type of insurance? I got various types of insurance, it's just not one policy. I started with a $150 policy when I was 24, 25 years old. I started graduating, bought different styles I will discuss here in a second. But listen, let's, let's take a quick uh, 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 an idea here. I wanna share with you something, I'll share a quick drawing. Oftentimes, people wanna build a financial house, right? The first thing they do is put money inside 401ks. Okay, why? Because it's at the job. 401ks, IRAs. Now they, want to buy, now they want to buy a home, right? Now they want to buy a home, an actual house, piece of real estate. Why? Because the way to create wealth in our country is through real estate ownership. That's, a, that's, a, that's a, what a lot of people try to tell you to do. Get your credit right, right? Get your finances right. Get your money inside your 401k. Max out your 401k. Put all your money inside 401k. Buy yourself a house, and next thing you know, 30, 40 years, you'll be rich. Listen, it doesn't take too far long ago to realize that in 08, 09, just 10, 11 years ago, this house here crumbled. And then the sad part about this, and then that's when people want to buy life insurance. And if this is your house, and the winds of life come blowing by and put stresses on themselves, what happens to this house? This house crumbles. So here's how you should build your financial house. It should start with insurance. That's the solid ground. When, 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 the, when the shit hits the fan, 
You got life insurance to build, to build from. And by the way, life insurance isn't just for dying. I'll give you an example here in a second. And then you start building your 401k plan, your IRAs. Right? You start building your savings, your investments, and then buy, then buy your real estate. And oftentimes people get it all twisted all around. And then, and then other things. You want to add? You want to get fancy with it? Throw, throw Bitcoin, throw Forex, throw stocks, bonds, and mutual funds outside of your 401k and IRA. Gold, silver. But the first thing you build it on is insurance. So, some, by the way, some of you I got all the pundits right now I know watching this video. Oh, no, I wouldn't do it that way. I wouldn't do it that way. Listen, I've got the experience here of 21 years. 21 years of seeing what has worked and what hasn't worked. You guys got theory. A lot of people watching this video right now, you got theory. I got 21 years of actually being in the shit. And I've seen all this stuff. You got certain hypotheticals in your theories, but you haven't lived through it. See, there's a difference between being smart and being wise. Listen, smart is, te is tested through experiences. Smart is tested through time. A lot of people are smart, but they haven't tested it through time. You're smart, your theory, but you haven't proven that theory through the worst of times. I I'm here to tell you, man, I'm, I'm one of those rare guys that has stood the test. Of Listen, I can't tell you, if I go in my, in my, in my uh, business cards, I can't tell you how many real estate agents, lawyers, Real estate lawyers can tell you how many tax people, mortgage people, stocks, bonds, and mutual funds people, especially downtown here in Chicago. You know, this is known as Second City. This is where the Chicago Board of Trade and the uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange is. I can't tell you what I've witnessed here in the last, just fit, not 20 years, just the last 50 years. It was the first 20, the first five years of my career. Was, everything was great. Everything was going great. It was the bull market of the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s. And then the dot-com bubble hit. And it took three, four years later for everybody to start getting laid off. Well, the market's corrected. Banks start laying people off. Real estate change shifted. All these different things. By the way, I am not saying not to get real estate. I'm not saying not to get stocks by your mutual funds. I'm not saying don't put your money inside 401k play. All I'm saying is this. Build your house on the first financial brick, which should be insurance, risk management. Plan for the worst, but expect the best. Now, let's break it down. Here are two styles. Two styles of life insurance. Two styles of life insurance. One you rent and one you own. Let's talk about the one you rent, which is called temporary. Life insurance is temporary in these styles. Term insurance for a certain term. 10-year term, 20-year term, 30-year term. Cheap premium, large death benefit. That's one that a lot of people commonly see. I'm going to get the least amount of life insurance, I'm sorry, the least amount of premium for the maximum amount of life insurance. And that's their policy, right? Another style, return of premium. So if nothing happens to you, you keep the policy, pop, 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 you pay your monthly premium, monthly premium. You, you have, let's say, a $100,000 policy, a $500,000 policy. You put 25 bucks into it, 50 bucks into it. Nothing happens to you. You pay a little bit more for this style, though. Nothing happens to you. Guess what? You get all your money back. R-O-P, return of premium. You know, so if you are either holding a policy or thinking about purchasing a policy, ask your agent. Do I have one of these two styles? Because I'll tell you this, a lot of agents don't offer the second one. I don't know why. They just offer the first one. Third one, group life. Where do you get group life term insurance policy? Through your job. So people say, oh, I got enough insurance. Where? Through my job. I remember I was in the Marine Corps. I mentioned the last, uh, the last episode that the, 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 the Marines uh, uh, brought us down, down to the ship's library to sign our wills and trusts and to sign for our SGLI insurance, Servicemen's Group Life Insurance. We pay like 15 to 20 bucks a month for it, $250,000 on life insurance. But as soon as, I, as soon as I left the military, as soon as I left the Marine Corps, as soon as I left my employer, guess what happened to that group policy? Uh, since I'm no longer part of that group, that policy terminated. It, it converted into VGLI, Veterans Group Life Insurance, and guess what happened to my premium since I'm no longer part of the group? Boom! I remember the staff sergeant, he was doing the numbers, he was going to calculate, he was calculating, if I want to keep my life insurance policy that I paid on through the military and convert it to a, F, a, a, a VGLI, Veterans Group Life Insurance, he was doing the math. <laughs> I remember him talking, his French guy, French accent, he was part of our flight equipment, he would issue us our helmets and, uh, and, our, and, our, and our vests in case, you know, we were to crash at sea, then the, the, the vest would inflate. Anyway, that's what his job, his, his job of flight equipment. And he was doing the math, he said, hey, uh, excuse me, you're telling me, because it's our transition class, to get out of the military, it's called the TAPS class. All the veterans watching this, have you been through the TAPS class? By the way, for all the veterans watching this, what education did they teach you about money when you leave the military? 
Do they give you a class when you're leaving the military or do they give you a class in boot camp? I'm interested in what you guys got to say because I got my class about finances, about financial planning and insurance when I was leaving the Marine Corps. I should have got that education at the beginning of my career. Anyway, I'm glad what you guys put, put in the comment section below. For any military guys, veterans uh, uh, watching this video. Anyway, they're filling out our forms. He goes, uh, excuse me, pretty soon if I stay with this VGLI, I'm probably going to pay $250,000 just to get $250,000. Doesn't make sense. So it made sense for him to get his own policy outside the group and get himself a, pro a policy privately between him and the insurance company. Not him, the employer, and then insurance company. No, it's between him, the individual, with directly through the insurance company, most likely through an agent, okay? And by the way, you think you can find an agent these days? The sad, here's a sad reality. A lot of insurance agents today, sad part about it, are no longer entering the field. A lot of insurance agents today are no longer entering this industry. It's even more importantly, not a lot of life insurance agents today are going to be aware of some of the things I'm going to share with you in this video because they're not getting trained the right way. There's no, no such, very rare are agents getting professional training in life insurance strategies. They say, okay, let me get you a quote, let me get you on the phone, let me get you a quote, blah, 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 blah. But they don't have a financial use or a financial planning use of how to use life insurance to actually create and build and grow in a state. And I'm glad that you're watching this video. Okay? Uh, so let's go for to the next style. So if you say, man, I don't want to rent, I, I want to own. Okay, let's talk about the styles that you own. So here's the styles that you own. It's called permanent policies. You know, oftentimes people get caught up in calling it permanent policies whole life. No, no, no. There's more than just whole life. But the first style of life insurance had been whole life. Okay? Uh, uh, back, back, in the, uh, back in the early 1800s, the first style of life insurance policies were actually created by Presbyterian pastors. The, 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 the ministries would go over and they started insuring pastors coming over from overseas. The first style of life insurance was right here. Right? To bring pastors, the Presbyterian life, to bring pastors over here safely. If they didn't come over here and save passage, boom, they pay a benefit to the church. The, the next style of life insurance, outside of whole life, then became universal. Why? Because whole life was fixed premium, uh, uh, fixed premium, fixed cost basically on a monthly basis or any basis, however you decide to pay your insurance, and then fixed death benefit. It was very rigid, can skip. You, right away, if you skip the premium payment, a monthly, uh, a monthly premium payment, you go into a grace period. So whole life was very rigid. Whole life would pay dividends. It would, uh, so in other words, dividends weren't dividends in, the na in nature. Ralph Nader discovered that dividends said dividends in the nature of stocks, bonds, and mutual funds weren't, an weren't actually dividends. Dividends were just simply an o uh, just a refund of overpayment of premiums. And as insurance companies would actually pay those dividends to the policyholders inside their policies. They call them dividends. Even though you overpay the policy per the cost of insurance, boom. And they call those dividends. It's a 1980 study by Ralph Nader. And the reason why a lot of people didn't like it is because it's rigid. And there's a lot of crusades where people say, man, this is such trash value. Well, for some of them, they're right. Why? Because the premium was higher because the premium would be less in the death benefit but add cash value to the policy. And so there's a school of agents in the marketplace that said this is trash value because for the same cost, right, even though you don't have any cash value, you can get a higher death benefit policy with the same amount of cost and the difference in terms of the cost of insurance, the difference you can invest inside that in mutual funds. The strategy was called buy term and invest the difference. Why should you put your money inside trash value? But here's what people discovered. You know, a lot of people discovered the, the invest the difference part, they didn't do. They bought the term insurance, but they didn't invest the difference. Actually, they spent the difference. You know why? Because lack of financial discipline into a lot of people. That if you weren't forced to save money, you wouldn't do it. That's why a lot of people have more money saved today in their 401k plans than they do in their own personal savings. You know why? Because 401k plans just take it out of your paycheck and they put it into an account that you can't touch until you're technically 59 and a half years old. It's called forced savings, 401k plans. Same thing too with pensions. They take your pension, your, 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 your check, your, uh, your, your pension dues, and they put inside a, a defined, uh, defined benefit plan, all right? And they define that at the age that you retire, you're going to get X amount of dollars per month. But a lot of pension plans have been going away. So pension plans have been going away. 401k plans are, are not used the right way. Guess what? Everybody then putting money inside 401k with an uneducated 
uh, uh, knowledge and understanding of how this money actually grows. Same thing too happens with life insurance. Let me ask you a question. For those of you who have 401k plans, when was the last time HR actually sat down with you and strategized with you how to put your money inside 401k plans? They probably did it, right? And by the way, why would the HR people do it? They're HR people. They're not financial people. So why would the HR people, it, why would the HR folks, matter of fact, the better HR says, well, I can't advise you on what to do with your 401k plan. Talk to a person that helps you with these 401ks. Boom. That's actually the right answer. But a lot, a lot of people are depending upon their HR to give them financial guidance on what to contribute to their 401k plan. Anyway, back to life insurance. Other styles of life insurance came around. Whole life. And then another advent came around called universal life. Why was universal life different? Because flexible premium. I can pay 200 bucks a month, 100 bucks a month, 50 bucks a month, back up to 200 bucks a month. Flexible premium. You didn't get caught. You weren't as rigid as the whole life policy. Same thing too with the death benefit. The death benefit was flexible. Flexible premium, flexible death benefit. It's called universal. Why? Because they wanted you to keep it for the rest of your life. They wanted you to keep it permanently. And then in the, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, they created something called variable universal life. Actually, it was variable whole life, and then variable universal life, which basically meant variable meant tied to the stock market. So your cash value, your cash that's inside this policy, even though this didn't have any cash value, term, because you're renting it, there is no cash value inside these styles because the premium is a little higher. The cash value starts to grow, not based on the dividends, not based on the creating rates of a universal life policy, but based on the stock market performance of what they call the sub-accounts. And these sub-accounts would up, down, up, down. The danger to this is what happens the economy kept dropping and dropping. Well, you potentially could implode your life insurance policy. It's a very risky type of style of policy. And then they create a hybrid of the universal. And they create a hybrid of the, in terms of flexibility, hybrid of the variable. It means attached somewhat to the stock market. They create an index policy where clients were directly putting money into the index, or like the S&P 500, but they're using a password called an insurance company, and the insurance company would put money directly into the stock market through the uh, chief investment officer of that insurance company, and they created something called the index, which would tie normally to an S&P 500 type of index, which a lot of people would grow their money in the gains only of the stock market, but none of the losses. So in other words, so in an index life insurance policy, you can grow when the market grows and lock it in. It's called the annual lock in and reset. And when the market drops, if the market drops, you, you experience none of the drops. You experience the drops here, the variable, but you don't experience that drops inside the index. Does that make sense? So here, the another style is what they call joint survivorship, joint policy or survivorship policy. And that means if two people are on this policy jointly, the only time the policy pays out a death benefit is both people sadly were to pass away. And then the policy pays out. It's called a joint policy or a survivorship style of life insurance policy. And so people often say, you know, life insurance is getting caught more costly and costly. Life insurance costs more money. Listen, I've been around for a minute where I've been with three different costs of insurance. In other words, insurance companies have a standard table per age, gender, and cost per thousand dollars of life insurance. It's called, a, it's called a CSO table, Commission Standard Ordinary. That's what it stands for. When I entered the insurance industry, they started off with the 1980. When I started off with the insurance industry, I started off with the 1980 table, and the policies would issue and stay around permanently until you're 90 to 100 years old, okay? And then they issued the 2000 and, uh, 2001 tables. People start issuing policies. The, the insurance company would start issuing policies to 100, 110 years old. And now the policies of today, they're issued to 120, some even 130 years old. So what does that mean for you? People today are living longer due to modern medicine and, and consciousness of health. People are living longer. I mean, there's a World War II veteran that I think is 110, 111 years old. So people today are living longer. And here's the thing, if people are living longer, guess what these insurance companies are doing? They're not paying out claims and benefits because they're able to keep these premiums. And what do you think these insurance companies do with these premiums? They invest it. They invested in the stock market. They invested in uh, 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 investment grade bonds. They invested in real estate, commercial real estate. They invested out in loans. They invested on loans. So if they can keep your money longer invested and they're earning more interest rate on it and people aren't dying sooner than later, guess what happens over time over the insurance uh, premiums? They're actually getting cheaper. And I think insurance companies today, their premiums are so cheap, like daring to have you buy life insurance. And let me repeat that one more time. The insurance premiums today are so cheap I think these insurance companies are daring you to buy life insurance and actually take care of your family the right way and building your house on solid financial ground. So let me give you some case studies.
Let me give you some case studies, okay? So if you don't think people are using life insurance to help them shelter and build millions and millions of dollars, let's take a look at Jim Harbaugh. Jim Harbaugh was, was drafted here by the Chicago Bears, went on to play for the uh, 49ers, and went to, I'm sorry, went to go play on for the Indianapolis Colts, was a head coach at Stanford and a head coach at 49ers, and today he's the head coach of uh, the, uh, the Wolverines at Michigan, University of Michigan. Well, he said, listen, part of my compensation plan, I want you to stuff a lot of my money inside a permanent life insurance policy. So there's a retention, uh, there's a desire for him to stay there longer because they're not just paying him just salary. This We're paying, paying this over a period of years. There's, so there's a benefit for him to want to stay there long term. If he doesn't stay there long term, the university doesn't pay his life insurance premiums. I believe at two million, I believe the article said here at uh, uh, two million dollars for the following five years to pay the premium on insurance policy. So oftentimes people are so miseducated. Oh my gosh, you're paying so much money for life insurance. No, 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 no. They're not paying for the standard temporary renting insurance. There's a financial strategy behind life insurance. More than just dying, he's buying it for the living. It's not just, it, so what he plans to, like when he's done coaching, guess where he's going to take his retirement money from? A combination of his 401k plan, other retirement accounts, Social Security, and guess what? Money inside is life insurance policy. If you don't think that was, uh, that was smart, look at, look at how all these smart people uh, handle their finances. This is 3M. This is the executives of 3M. This is, what they co this is how they compensate their executives. So we got here uh, 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 Michael, Joaquin, Julie, Ashish, Nicholas, Ayn, Ng, uh, Thulin, I'm sad I'm pronouncing it the wrong way, and Michael F. Roman. The, they, these are executives that are contributing 4,500 bucks to the 401k plan. You're thinking to myself, wait a minute, you contribute $21,000, $22,000 to a 401k plan. Why are you only putting $4,500 into your 3M 401k plan? You know what I'm thinking? I, I think that's probably the match. I think they're just contributing to their 401k plan up to the match, and they're redirecting their money to this other strategy called, hmm, it says VIP, excess company contributions, and hmm, executive life insurance. So they're stuffing a lot of money inside executive life insurance. So why are they putting $23,000 into an insurance policy? Why are they putting eleven, twelve thousand, eight thousand, fifteen thousand dollars of money inside life insurance, respectively? It's not to get this cheap temporary policy. This executive life insurance is, is going to grow value over a period of time of which you can access in a very tax advantage basis. Let's take a look, let's take a look at a proxy statement here of, uh, of GE. The proxy statements here, uh, page, uh, was it, 79 here? This is the top execs also of GE. They're putting money inside the retirement plan. They're putting collectively $94.50 for each one of these executives into the retirement plan, right? But if you look to the left column, they're putting life insurance premiums of $172,000, dollars $107,000, $62,000, $226,000, $227,000, $136,000 a year into their life insurance policies. So it doesn't mean it's this cheap term. So if anybody's advising you, oh my gosh, your life insurance policy is so expensive. No, go back to this. Life insurance policies are standardized in terms of their cost of insurance. Different insurance companies have different premiums, of course, but relatively speaking, all of them use the CSO table for gender, uh, uh, age, um, and also for uh, cost per thousand dollars of life insurance. So why would they put their money into something like this? Here's why. Let's take a look at this. I call this my four homes of money. Because money needs a home. Four homes of money. Here we go. Let's talk about it. This has been my system. This has been my system. Uh, my first financial mentor that invested a lot of money into teaching me the rules of the money game was a gentleman by the name of Douglas Andrew. And uh, I, wrote, I, I read his book, Missed Fortune 101. I read his book, I went to the back of it, and I got coached by him because I called the 800 number on the back of it, went up to Salt Lake City, Utah. And for years, I've, I've, I've studied his practices, I studied the way he structured policies and deals, and I'll tell you this, more importantly, my policy, many of my, my own personal clients' policies, had withstood the test of time during the 08, 09 Great Recession and the current pandemic recession, and still in force, and that brick, that life insurance policy is still there. The life insurance policy is still there. Their 401k may have collapsed a little bit, their real estate values and paper may have collapsed a little bit, but guess what, it's still standing the test of time. The money inside their life insurance policies, because the money, not only the death benefit stayed the same, but the cash value they built inside it also stayed the same because it's not tied to the stock market. So let's take a look. 
four values I would like my serious money to grow. I'm not talking about your gambling money, your hope to get rich quick money. I'm talking about your serious money that you know needs to be there at a time where you need the money the most. And the values I would like for it to have, the characteristics I like it to have, I like the, my, my money liquid, I like my money safe, I like my money to earn a decent rate of return above inflation, and when I take my money out, I like to have tax advantages with my money. See, these are some basic four tenets. So let me ask you this question. When somebody's telling you to put your money somewhere, what's your system, what's your process? So if you're not using one, consider using this. It's a system. Save yourself time, energy, and money. So therefore you're less emotional about money and you have a process on how to evaluate a decision on where to place your money. Because before I became a cash flow millionaire, I was making $20,000 a year as a sergeant in the Marines. So I need to make sure I was smart with my money. I may not have been the fastest guy in the stock market, I may not be the fastest guy with real estate and all that stuff, but here's what I solidified over my career. Savings and cushion, and I solidified my income because I've chose a career in the insurance industry that withstood the multiple recession I've been through and obviously now through the, through, through the pandemic. All right, first one, what am I talking about? Liquidity, is my money liquid inside banks? Yes. Is my money liquid with, uh, is my money safe with banks? Yes, up to $250,000, FDIC insurance. Is my money in the banks earning a decent rate of return above inflation? Are you freaking kidding me? Right, at best 0.25, 0.5% uh, interest. Which means that if your money was to grow, if your money was to grow, it'd take you 140, 150, 160 years for your money to finally double. So your $1,000 that you invest there at 0.5%, it's gonna take you 144, 155 some years, assuming that stays the same interest rate, for your money to finally double. Do you wanna wait that long? Tax advantage. So when I withdraw my money, assuming this is a, this is a normal account, I have, to ha I have to pay taxes, so it's no. Okay, yes, yes, no, no. Yes, yes, on liquidity and safety, no, no. On rate of return, it, doesn't not, it does not earn a rate of, decent rate of return above inflation, and it does not have tax advantage of using savings accounts or CDs. So let's take a look at 401ks and IRAs. The money, I'm, I'm assuming, is gonna be invested into the stock market, which is pretty common for a lot of 401ks and IRAs to be invested in. Okay, so liquidity, is my money liquid inside a 401k? No! You're not supposed to use that money until you're 59 and a half years old. If you do, there's a 10% withdrawal penalty and you gotta pay income tax, federal and state income tax, depending on what state that you live in, but you definitely gotta pay federal tax on top of the 10% early withdrawal penalty. And had it not been for this CARES Act that uh, uh, President Trump put in, he put in the CARES Act that if you need to take money out of your 401k, they're, they're suspending the 10% early withdrawal penalty. But what's that doing for people in a 401k plan? It's spending down the money they saved hard for retirement, that the company matched for their retirement. Safety. Is my money safe with inside a 401k and IRA if, is it, is it related to the stock market? No. Does, does money inside a 401k IRA earn a decent rate of return? Assuming that the market's doing well, yes. But everybody knows you can lose money in the stock market too. Because there's no ceiling, there's no floor. Tax advantages. Well, it's tax, it's tax deferred as it's growing. So in other words, you don't pay taxes on the growth and your contributions, but you do pay tax on the withdrawals. 100% of what you withdraw is now exposed to income taxation by the federal government, depending on your state, also state income tax. So no, no, yes, it's like a half yes, and also a half yes for 401ks and IRAs. Real estate, everybody said, oh, you put all your money inside real estate, right? Smart people that never own real estate say, put your money inside real estate. Be careful of who you listen to with your money. Be careful you listen. Hey, you know, if, if they've never accomplished much in their entire life, but they want to give you financial guidance and, 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 and insight on what to do with your money, even though they've never made it, you got to be careful about listening to those people. You got to listen to people that have been there, done that. You know, don't listen to the peanut gallery that has, has, has given you advice from the cheap seats. So real estate, liquidity. Do I, so if, if I put my money inside real estate, if I put my, my 5%, my 10%, my 20% down, the, when the, when's the only time I get my money out of my real estate? Assuming the bank allows me to do a cash out refinance is when I sell it. So the only way to get my money back is either to sell it or refinance it. Otherwise, it's paper gains or paper losses, okay? 
So it's not liquid. No. Is my money safe? Well, up until 08, 09, everybody was saying, real estate safe, real estate safe, can't lose in real estate. Until they found it 08, 09, how sad that was. People working hard to build their American dream, they tied, associated their American dream to real estate, owning property, having own home ownership. So yes, when the market's doing well, but no, when the market's crashing. And by the way, what do you think is gonna to happen to the real estate market now with this COVID-19, with this pandemic, and these businesses shutting down and COVID checks being issued out and money being sent out to, to all these different uh, businesses? What do you think is gonna eventually happen to income taxes down the road? Rate of return, okay? Yes and no. Yes, if you're in a good zip code. No, if you're in a bad zip code. But then again, there lies the opportunity too if you're a real estate investor. Okay, tax advantages. Okay, does my money have tax advantages? Depends on if you're single or you're married, and I'm assuming this is your residential property. Okay, if this is your home and you're single, the government allows you, the IRS allows you to have a certain amount of growth. It's called a capital gain without it being income taxable. At the recording of this video, if you're single, and let's say you bought a house for 250 and it grows to 500,000, and you're single, you sell for 500,000, that 250 is tax advantage. There's no taxes, there's no capital gains on that 250. If it goes to 300,000 gain, now that, that, that 50,000 is above the 250, now it's income, is, is a capital gains taxable, okay? If you're married, it's 500,000. So those are things that you have to ask your tax person. If you buy property or sell property, well, it's a different story if you're thinking about real estate investing, if this is property that you're investing in because now things fall into either short-term capital gains tax or long-term capital gains tax. But there's a, amount, a significant amount of tax advantages when you put your money inside real estate, big time. So that's a big attraction to it too as well. But listen, if your money really isn't growing and you're just fighting to pay the mortgage, you're fighting to keep tenants in the building, who cares what the tax advantages are? Tax advantages like... You know, a cherry on top of a banana split. If you don't get it, fine. I just want, I want the banana split. So in this example, if I'm using my checklist of liquidity, safety, rate of return, real estate, again, has two of the four. Let's look at this mystery industry. There is such an industry where your money is liquid. There is such an industry, a financial tool, your money is safe. There is such a financial tool, your money is earning a decent rate of return above inflation. There is such a tool where your money has significant tax advantages that you don't have to wait till you're 59 and a half years old to withdraw your money to pay for your kid's college education or retire on. You know what that is? You guessed it, life insurance. Structured, a prop, structured appropriately according to these laws here, okay? You gotta make sure, and some people say, well, what's the, what's the laws that allows me to do this? Well, the IRS code says a death benefit under 101 says no death benefit is income taxable. Section 7702 and 72E say a money, money is properly structured inside a life insurance policy based on cash value accumulation test or a guideline premium test, which your life insurance agent probably does not know about, can grow in a very significant way. So these IRS laws help favor those insurance contracts properly structured according to these, these, uh, these tax, uh, tax acts. TEFRA of 1982, DEFRA of 1984, TAM of 1988, which basically means that you can stuff money inside these insurance contracts with the IRS trying to stick their hand into it. And these things were done in the 80s. See, a lot of different financial tools today, like Bitcoin, and other financial uh, 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 strategies. They're being challenged right now because they're new. See, life insurance has been around for a minute. It's been through reform for a minute. The Armstrong Act, uh, the Life Insurance Armstrong Act, 19, I think 1903 or 1904, helped continue the, the transparency and the, the, the legal obligations that life insurance have to maintain reserves to make sure that it can pay their promises because a lot of life insurance companies today have been around for a very, very long time. Matter of fact, a lot of my life insurance policy today on my desk, you know, one of the life insurance companies that has been around since the United States had 30 states. And, uh, and no, there's nothing new about New Mexico. It's still Mexico. <laughs> there's, there's nothing uh, Arizona uh, about that state. It was still Mexico. That's how long one of these life insurance companies that I have, the policies that I have, has been around. So when you're having a conversation around these different things, you know, there's a combination of flow. So as you're building, back over here, if you're building your financial house, what do you want to build your 
foundation on. And these how these how millionaires strategize on how to have a financial tool. So therefore, they can keep the main thing the main thing. They keep the main thing their business, their career, and they don't have to worry about their financial house crumbling. That's how you build your house on solid ground. So even when the worst case scenario happens, boom, whatever I've built, boom, I'm passing it to my family. Okay, so if you've wondered, let me give you some data. Let me give you some facts here. If you ever wonder if people are buying life insurance, especially right now during the COVID, especially during the recession, check this out. Life, there's, there's some data here by the ACLI, the American Council of Life Insurance. Here's the data. Okay? They, they put here, they put here that life insurance in force that is due to be paid to beneficiaries over the next years is $34 trillion. $34 trillion is due to be paid to a beneficiary, beneficiaries in the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And so people are still buying life insurance to the tune of $3.1 trillion. Again, data given here by the ACLI, the American Council of Life Insurance, life insurers. And if you thought that life insurance didn't have a big play in assistance to this program called Social Security, listen, if it wasn't for the life insurance industry, if it wasn't for the life insurance industry, I don't know where Social Security would be today, but life insurance supplements Social Security by $1.5 trillion over the next nine years. The life insurance industry has more than $8.6 trillion invested into the economy. By the way, I'm gonna be doing a video here of downtown Chicago. Some of the biggest buildings here owned by life insurance companies will probably shock you. You drive by them, you're seeing them, and every major city has big buildings owned by life insurance companies. But the reason why the government, the reason why the government gives such favorable laws to the life insurance industry, because the life insurance industry is a big partner, financially speaking, to the independent person, to its citizens. Why? Because if the citizens didn't have the opportunity to get life insurance and take advantage of these tax laws, these citizens would have to depend upon the government in terms of social service programs. So the government now says, listen, if you buy your own policy, if you buy your own private insurance, you buy your own private permanent insurance, temporary policy, we'll give you significant tax advantages. Because now you're self-insuring yourself you're not depending upon church, you're not depending upon charity, and you're definitely not dependent upon who? The government. So therefore, the insurance carriers, insurance industry has some very, very favorable tax laws. All right, so as I wrap up, ask yourself these two questions. You've been thinking that life insurance is only for rich people, or you need money for life insurance, or it's expensive. I'm telling you right now, these are things that a lot of people say about it and think about it that keeps people broke. You don't ever build generational wealth thinking that way. You don't build generational wealth not building a financial foundation. And you have to ask yourself, is life insurance just life insurance or am I utilizing it also as an asset as I build my accounts in my banks, 401k plan, stock, stock brokerage accounts, real estate. Life insurance is screaming, say, hey, could you please let me in? I too am an asset. And ask yourself these things, priorities. You got insurance in your car. You can't leave the car lot. You, you qualify for a car loan. You're driving off with it. Oh, come a cool car now, dream car. But you can't drive the car lot without what? Car insurance. You close on your property. You get the keys to the property, the title company, but you can't get it unless you have house homeowners insurance. For some apartments, you can't even get your apartment until you have rental insurance. Devices. How many guys got Apple Pay in your cell phones? How many times you go down to Best Buy and say, hey, oh, well, you bought a stereo set and whatever. We'll let you have the... Best Buy protection plan for another 10, 15 bucks a month. Uh, for some of you, so upset about Netflix, about cuties, oh, 100%, 100%. Okay, you canceled your Netflix subscription. You don't like whatever, the, the political, whatever the case may be. By the way, I agree. <laughs> that, 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 that show there that they mentioned, I mentioned, you guys know what I'm talking about. I'm not even gonna mention it. Should be absolutely off Netflix. But some of you guys are so upset about that, about that show. How can, I can't believe Netflix endorses a program like that and, and, and they put a documentary like that and put it on their, on, their, on, their, uh, on their subscription. So you guys canceled your Netflix subscription because you don't support that. Cool. All right. You realize for 14, 15 bucks, you can get yourself a solid life insurance, even if it's a temporary plan that you could potentially convert later on to a permanent plan. It's like rent to own. So redirect some of this money that you're spending over here to things that actually matter. That actually helps you build an asset. These things... Life insurance just isn't an expense. Life insurance smartly used, the way millionaires think about it, it builds 
an asset and creates generational wealth. Number two, if you want to become a first generation cash flow millionaire, the strategy is to anticipate. Let me ask yourself this question. Do you think one day, do you think one day they're going to bury you and put you in the ground? Well, if that's the case, and you expect to have a long life in between, you anticipate to have money over a long time, you anticipate also to have quality forms of health. If you don't have quality health, you want the best type of health care. You know, these are things you gotta ask yourself. You wanna have a long, fruitful, happy life where you have quality of life. These are things you gotta anticipate. And if that's the case, who's gonna pay for all that? Well, oftentimes people say, well, life insurance is only for the dying. Do you realize today, then in the modern era, modern policies today have what they call living benefits. Listen, watch this video here right here. Listen, watch this video right here. It's about Dustin and Kenya Frampton. Dustin and Kenya built my first website, mattsapala.com. Decides to become a client of our firm. Make a long story short, at 38 years old, never thought he'd ever have to suffer a stroke. But thank God he had what? Life insurance, because he's alive and well today, runs his own agency together with us here at PHP Agency, and he's so happy he bought a life insurance policy because he realized after educating himself that it isn't just for the dying, it's actually for the living. Watch this video, you'd be shocked. You'd be surprised how life insurance was used and what Kenya Frampton, his wife, had to say, who's from the south side of Chicago. Third, last but not least, generational wealth. Do you want to create generational wealth? Let me, let me share with you some celebrity stories here. Here are six celebrities who made unfortunate life insurance decisions. In other words, they didn't have life insurance. Heath Ledger, Larry King, Michael Jackson. Matter of fact, here's another video you should watch. Uh, when Michael Jackson died, had it not been for his catalog, where he owned the Beatles catalog, he, I think he had something like uh, 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 $400 million in debt. He had a large amount of money in debt. I, did, I went on WGN News Network to discuss the estate of Michael Jackson, sadly, when he passed away. And due to a lack of life insurance, he was unable to satisfy his estate, was unable to satisfy a lot of the debts that was related to his estate due to a lack of life insurance. Another one here was Lenny Bruce. Uh, number five was Whitney Houston. You know, who doesn't love uh, both Michael Jackson and Whitney Houston songs, but didn't have life insurance policies, right? Um, uh, Corey Haim, uh, just recently, uh, Aretha Franklin, didn't have a will. Families fighting over Aretha Franklin's estate. And you would think these celebrities we have some smart people around them to get them to do the right thing with their, with their career and the money and the, uh, the, the, the obviously the, the talent and fame that they built throughout their entire life. But nobody helped them build their financial transfer to the next generation. And uh, how many guys are Fast and Furious fans? Well, Paul Walker. Paul Walker sadly passed away. Pa passed away in a car crash. And sadly, guess who he died with in the passenger seat in that car crash? His financial advisor didn't get a will or trust established, nor did he establish a proper life insurance policy. Had not been for the claim through Fireman's Fund that through the movie house, because the movie house had insurance on the whole project, right? Back over into priorities. The insurance was on the project of the movie being finished. It wasn't life insurance. That's where his daughter got the $10 million claim. It wasn't through life insurance. It's through the claim of the project, one of their stars dying in the filming of the project, that one of the largest claims of insurance claims, not life insurance, but the project of the Fast and Furious project, it paid out a claim because it couldn't finish a pro, uh, the, they couldn't finish the movie because one of the key stars had sadly died, but it didn't have life insurance. And back on, on Generation Wealth, if you plan to build a business, if you plan to, if, if you plan to uh, establish some form of trust, an easy way to establish that, the cheapest form to establish a, a, a trust and fund the trust is through a properly structured life insurance policy. If you guys plan, if you're single, if you plan on having more than $11 million in your life, you gotta watch out for the death tax, estate tax. Anything less than $11.4 million of your net worth, your estate, non-taxable. But anything above that, let's say I have a $20 million estate, $30 million estate, decide to invest in some property, invest in some movies, invest in some, Assets that uh, are over $11.4 million, guess what? Your families have filled out the final tax forms and they have to put on your, what your total net worth was. And based on that net worth, it's over $11.4 million or you didn't establish what they call an AB trust. And you, you and your wife didn't use both your estate tax credits. Guess what you're exposed to now? Death tax, estate tax. And here's the sad part about that. You can't come back and complain. With that being said, 
I want to know your thoughts. I want to know your, your first reactions to this conversation. Did you ever think that life insurance was this involved? And by the way, I can continue to nerd out on this thing. I've, been, I've, I've helped clients for the last 14 years when I was a writing agent before I decided to establish my own agency. Because here, here's what I figured. I can only help. This was the reason I chose entrepreneurship, not just being in sales, is because I can only help 80 to 100 clients a year doing this stuff. Okay? But since I've built a firm, I built an agency of helping people the last five years, we've been able to help 45,000 clients. So, so it's not just a life insurance conversation here with the Seven Figure Squad, it's also an entrepreneurial conversation of how I scaled. And if you wanna know how to scale, you wanna start strategizing more like a millionaire, this is the channel for you to follow. So again, I'd love to know your thoughts, I'd love to know your feedback. Let me know what you're thinking. What was your biggest takeaway from this video? And let me remind you, our next milestone is crossing 25,000 subs. And I want to remind you that we're going to give them some, some free giveaways. And uh, speaking of giveaways, uh, for those of you that choose to share this video, okay, oh, uh, by the way, since I got these books, some books for you to consider reading uh, about life insurance, uh, uh, Power of Zero by David McKnight, uh, Confessions of a CPA, The Truth About Life Insurance. Here's a CPA discussing the power of life insurance. I mentioned earlier, Douglas Andrew, he also wrote another book called The Last Chance Millionaire and a couple other two books, Secrets of a Millionaire Mind, T.R. Eckert, and one of my favorite, Paul Zane Pilzer, who exposed my mind for some of you faith-based people out there thinking that making money is a sin. Well, listen, Paul Zane Pilzer, who's an economist, also a faith-based person, says, listen, God wants you to be rich. He wants you to pass on wealth to the next generation, so therefore you guys can continue to make an impact in our world. And if that's you, I'd love to know that's your thought process. I want to know that you want to make an impact. I want to, I want to know that you want to make a difference. And that's what the community of the Seven Figure Squad is all about. And back to the giveaway, uh, my mentor wrote this book called The Laser Fund, which actually is a, a more of an expansion of this, okay, for two types of people, right? Uh, uh, for the left brain folks, nuts and bolts, if you, you want to nerd out on this stuff, here's a part of the book you want to read. If you're more of a relationship person, you want to see the overall arching uh, a theme of it, right here. So this is actually two books in one, okay? If you are the person that is watching this video and you share it, you comment below, I want to give you a book from Douglas Andrew, not just from Douglas Andrew, but signed by Douglas Andrew. Three people, three people, we're going to select, my team is going to select three people that shares this video the most, whether you share it on LinkedIn, whether you share it on Facebook, whether you share it with somebody, let me know that you shared it in the comment section below. We'll circle you, identify you, and we want to give the three of you a book here by Douglas Andrews, signed by the author, and we want you to get up to speed on how millionaires strategize in establishing a financial foundation to their financial home using life insurance. Remember, this uh, recording of this video is recorded in September of 2020. Why? Because this is Life Insurance Awareness Month, and we just want to make sure you're aware of this financial tool called Life Insurance to help you become a first-generation cash flow millionaire. So with that being said, guys, I appreciate you tuning in. If you haven't done so already, make sure you click like to follow our Facebook business page if you're watching it on Facebook. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe, hit notification, be alerted next time we upload our next episode. So therefore, we can help you think like a millionaire, help you strategize like today, to become a millionaire. And so therefore you can absolutely become a first generation cash flow millionaire in your entire family. Yes, we want to inspire you to do that by subscribing here to our channel. That being said, I'm your money smart guy. Until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to live smart, and be money smart today.